Jesus said, I in them and thou in me, that thou made me made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, them as thou hast loved me. He, how does the Lord love me? Just like he loves Jesus. Well, if that don't make you happy, you may as well go ahead and go on home now because ain't nothing else gets any better than that than that I'm loved by the Lord the same way that he loves Jesus. And then he went on to say in the next verse of John 3, 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Now, he, he don't have to have no condemnation. We got the church to do that. <laughs> Somebody was telling me about that. That was come out in Sunday school this morning. He, the Lord doesn't condemn. You know, the only thing, that, that he said, your heart will condemn you. But the Lord convicts. And when he convicts, he, he delivers you from a thing he convicted you from. And then you get set free. Amen. Well, but we're talking about loving like he loved. And, and so I, I want to move on just a little bit. We're, we're going to, when, when Jesus was there, you know, one of the things that love does is it, when love was dying for us, love had been mistreated. Love had been taken advantage of. Love had been beaten. Love had had his beard stripped out. Love had been spit upon. Love had been criticized. Love had been mocked. And, and, and I heard somebody that, that said this, and I don't know it to be a fact, but every time I ever saw them hanging on the cross, they were hanging way up there like that. I heard a man say that that wasn't how it was at all, that they were barely a, a step off of the ground. And, and the important that was, you, you know, when they would nail them there and then nailed them here, one of the hardest thing was to breathe. So as the pain, they, they had to pull up against that pain, against those nails to try to get a breath of air. And what made it hard was just, just a, a, a foot down there. If I could just get my foot down, I could, could stand up and breathe. So the bad thing about the stand-up dentist, so the bad thing about that, if that be the case, and Dennis was lifted up six inches off the ground, I could still have very much access eye to eye to spit in his face to tell him, and that's what they did to the Lord. He was hanging right there. And, and, and after he went through all that, thank you, Dennis. I didn't, didn't spit in your face today. <clears throat> after, if, after he had did all that, and he'd been ridiculed, he'd been abused. Josephus, Josephus, a Bible historian, said that the, the cat of nine tails on his back was so severe that the weight of the cross caused his intestine to actually protrude out his back. And he was dying not for his sin, he was dying for my sin. He was dying for your sin. He didn't deserve, that was the perfect Lamb of God. That was love made manifest. That's the one that loved us when we was unlovable. He loved us when we were at our very worst. He loved us with his very best. But in the midst of all that dying and all that suffering, he took the time out to do something that the church needs to learn how to do today. He took the time out to forgive. How did he forgive? He forgave by praying. Let me tell you something. Forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness, you decide to forgive. You know, and, and, and once that, and sometimes when you decide to forgive, you don't feel like you did. I don't know that Jesus had any Holy Ghost bumps when he prayed this prayer. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. But as an act of his will, he chose to forgive. One of the things that holds prisoners, I, I do a lot of prison ministry. I was up there Thursday night. Thanksgiving, I always get to have two family meetings. I know some of y'all do more than that, but I meet with my family, my blood family, and, and then I go meet with my family that's in prison. And, and, and they're in that prison 
we, you know, we, we was sharing and, and, and expressing about the love of God, and some of those folks there have a real problem with forgiving the person maybe that they feel like was responsible for them being there. And so though they're in prison there, and they can serve their time, and they can get out, but if they don't forgive, they're still as much a prisoner as they was when they was behind the razor wire. And the church house that's full of people, not just church, every place. It, how many went Black Friday shopping? Come on, be honest. You're in the house of God. Don't lie about it. I mean, okay, ain't nothing wrong with that. So you in a store with a whole lot of folks that probably are a prisoner to somebody that did them wrong. We justify, if somebody does us wrong, we justify holding a grudge because they had no right to do that to me. They had no right. So, so, so you wind up feeling like that, that, that you're justified for your feeling. But you know who the prisoner in the cell is? It's you. And the day, and, and, and here again, I, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm not an evangelist, but I, I, I want to tell you, I want to help some folks. It, 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 it's, uh, in America, and it's, and it's worse, I think, now than it ever has been. Uh, sexual abuse in both boys and girls. And, and, and those people, hell couldn't get too hot for them. You, you know, you know if, if I was the judge... But that's, it's not, did they do you wrong? Yes, they absolutely did you wrong. And some folks have been carrying that scar and that wound for all this time, and you wonder sometimes why you have such a struggle. The Lord wants you to be able to forgive. And so, well, how do I do that? You start out by praying for them. Amen. Now, most of us already prayed, Lord, I pray that they run into a brick wall at 100 miles an hour. You, you know, I pray that, that they suffer the way I've suffered. That's not kind of, that, that ain't prayer. That's vengeance. And maybe all you can do is start out with say, Lord, you know the situation of, of so and so. And today I just want to lift them up. Maybe that's all you can say the first time. Maybe the next day or the next week you can say, Lord, I don't think that they deserve, it's, it's okay, you're, you're talking to God, he knows what you think anyway. I don't think that they deserve any special treatment, but I ask that you would, because you think different than I think, your ways are not my ways, your thoughts are not my thoughts, I ask, Lord, that you would deal with them in your way. Yes. You know, eventually you'll come to the place that you can pray, Lord, I pray that you would cleanse them and forgive them just like you forgave me. And when you get to that place where you can begin to pray that prayer of forgiveness, it'd be like a flood one day. The floodgates open up and your emotions will run wild with you then because you know that you know that you've forgiven them. Now, that, now they, it may not change them at all, but it will definitely change you. Somebody say Amen. Okay, so that's, that's, that's part of loving like he loved. Is, is I'm glad he forgave me, aren't you? And, 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 and I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to go here and list all the reasons. And, and I could give a whole lot of reasons why he shouldn't forgive me. And let me tell you something else you have to forgive. I, I don't want to move off this. You've got to forgive you. Sometimes you don't have that person, that wicked person in your life. You're the person that you're down on because you know that you messed up. Well, welcome to the club. Amen. Anybody in here that has never messed up, jump up and dirt a somersault. <laughs> no, that we all messed up. And the Lord forgave me anyways. But so many times we receive his forgiveness and we know that we know that we know that our sins are under the blood. But our heart is still condemning us, and we need to accept that same forgiveness for ourselves, that we can know that we are precious in his eyes, and that he would walk in here yes. and say, I, the Father, want you to know that he loves you. Amen. 
just like he loves me. Amen. And the last point of this, and, and the other thing that, that Jesus did that night before he went to do all that, knowing that he was facing the cat of nine tails, knowing that they were going to pluck his beard out because it was prophesied in the word, knowing he, he had known he came for that end. On his last night before all this happened, when they had their meal, and we all enjoy the last, and we see pictures of the Last Supper, but it ended with him putting a towel. Now, there was, you can find in a word where they had discussion among themselves who would be the greatest in the kingdom, who could sit on his right hand, who sat on his left hand. But Jesus noticed there was proud hearts and dirty feet there. And the Son of God, the last act, that he was able to do before he went to that cross was he put on a towel and did the lowest form of servanthood that a man could do. Ordinarily, when somebody you go to somebody's house, like you come to my house, and if that was still a tradition today, Alex is out out there. So, and if you need your feet washed, I'd say you need your feet washed, Chick. Okay, Alex, would you? Uh... <laughs> But Jesus, the master, it wasn't too dirty for him. Right. It wasn't too lowly for him. And he said that the greatest in the kingdom is the one who serves. And I will tell you, it's joyful. Today we were talking about all the different gates. It's, it's, it's joyful when you go through the sheep gate, the, the, the Lamb of God came through that sheep gate to be the sacrifice. It's, it's glorious when we, the sign of the early church, or the sign of the Christian was the fish, we become the wiggly ones, and all the things that happen. But I, I want to tell you, when you come to the myth God gate, the place of assignment, where you step up and you begin to serve, true Christianity is made known through serving. I'm going to say that again. I said, true Christianity is made known through serving. So, so I, I want to, uh, I'm probably going to cut this way too short, but, but let's, let's talk about a couple of servants today. How many ever heard of David Wilkerson? Anybody ever heard of David Wilkerson? Your ever rehab that's successful now is patterned after what, and, and David had, what he had to do, he had to give up everything that he was, everything he knew, to go there to take on a role of servanthood. And because of that, it would be amazing if we could know how many thousands or hundreds of thousands or maybe million that have been set free from drugs, have been set free from alcohol, have been set free from pornography, have been set free from set free from set free from set free. Because one man laid down his life and stepped up and took on the role of servanthood. I, I'm telling the church, you cannot be completely successful in the kingdom if you don't have a servant's heart. Sandy, I wish he was, that he was in here, but you know, many, many years ago, I, I thought about this, you and Carolyn, I know it was because of all the money you made doing it at the Highland Hills Christian Academy, but it, it, was a, it was a servant's attitude. It was given. And I don't know how many, down over the years, how many of those kids that you got to sow the love of Jesus into their heart all those many years ago, but that Tyler, our youth pastor, is one that came through y'all's ministry and, and your life was touched by him then. And you don't ever know when there's going to be the next David Wilkerson or the next, or you say, well, now you're just doing this male chauvinist. No, I'm not. How about Mother Teresa? A little, a little bitty woman that laid down her life and, and, and touched the world in such a way, it's a servant's heart that caused that to happen. You can't be everything that you need to be for the Lord without having a servant's heart. So, so I'm thankful that, that I'm loved by love. I'm thankful that I have been forgiven I'm thankful the Lord has caused me, and, and there may be some, if the Lord, I, I, there's somebody, if, if I offend anybody, please don't let me walk around as an offender. 
if I've offended you in any way, shape, or form, I would love for you to call me or text me or something so I can humbly apologize so that, and, and if there's anybody in here, and I, I'm looking for folks that I can apologize to that, that I've hurt, that I've done wrong, because I don't want to be a prisoner to anything. I want to be a prisoner of love, don't you? Well, let, let, let's, unforgiveness will, will uh, or when you grant forgiveness to somebody, you know, sometimes we look for an excuse. How many know there's biblical reasons that you can have a divorce? Y'all didn't know that. Well, there is biblical reasons that you can get a divorce. Adultery, is very clearly. But you know, it could be that if forgiveness could come in right there, it could be the starting of a tremendous walk with God and many, many lives be changed by, by folks that because you went through that hurt, you, you know, other people get set free. Well, uh, I, I want to I, I wanna give you all the chance to, uh, to allow the Lord. First off, you need to understand that He's done paid all the price. There's not any sins that's recorded in any place that can't be forgiven. You, you know, the, the recorded, we talk about there is, there is, a, a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shake you a little bit right here. How about know, know that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, it, it talks about that's an unforgivable sin. I'm going to tell you that there is another one. So well, where you get that at? If you don't forgive, you can't be forgiven, according to the word.